All right, uh, I'm going to go ahead and get started, and um, it's just right on 7 o'clock. Maybe a couple people will join as we uh, get started, but um, just want to welcome you all to the second night of the um, Direct-to-Consumer Beef webinar series. Um, just as a reminder, if you were on last night, I'm going to go through some of the, the same things at the beginning, but I'm going to cover them in case someone wasn't on last night. Um, so last night, we talked about production. That was our focus. And Tonight we're focusing on processing, planning, and marketing local beef. And tomorrow night we are going to focus on sales and um, just have great partners and presenters for this series. Um, tomorrow night we'll have a buyer panel, uh, which will include um, a chef, someone from an institution, and someone who sells retail beef, um, as well as we'll learn about consumer preferences for beef. So I know it's the third and final night of the series, but um, you won't want to miss it. And this webinar series was kind of created out of us as an organization. I'm seeing a lot of producers across the state being really interested in finishing beef, processing it, and selling it. Um, that was a trend before COVID, but it's definitely been accelerated by COVID-19 in the last couple of months, as I'm sure you all know. Um, my name is Olivia Vogel, and I'm a local food project coordinator for the Kentucky Center for Agriculture and Rural Development. And I want to introduce my colleague, Spencer, also. Hey, good evening, everyone. Uh, as Olivia said, my name is Spencer Gwynn, and I'm a business development specialist with the Kentucky Center for Ag and Rural Development, or KCARD. And uh, I've been here for about three years now, so looking forward to tonight. Great. Um, I'm going to go to the first slide here, just tell you a little bit about KCARD. Um, we are an independent nonprofit organization that was established in 2001 to facilitate agricultural and rural business development in the state of Kentucky. Uh, I've got on the screen here what we do and how we serve, but in brief, we, uh, we provide educational opportunities, one-on-one -on -one technical assistance, and business support services to new and existing agribusinesses in the state of Kentucky. Um, KCARD has also launched the Kentucky Local Food System Expansion Initiative, which um, is a project that I'm primarily working on now um, and it's, it's to expand local food purchasing in the state of Kentucky. And um, we'll discuss that a little bit tomorrow night, but if you'd like details on that or other KCARD services, um, feel free to check our, our website. In the meantime, uh, we've got lots of information there. Um, before we get started, I just wanna go over some housekeeping items so you know how to participate in tonight's webinar. At any time in the webinar tonight, you can submit questions and comments into the Q&A um, box. We have disabled chat, um, so we're fielding everything to that, that Q&A box, and Spencer will be monitoring that. And at the end of each uh, person's presentation, we, we should leave some time for Q&A. So be sure to uh, get your questions in there. That's a big part of this, um, and we welcome it. And uh, we'll be recording this webinar and sharing the link with you all at the end of the week. We hope for that to go out on Friday. Uh, we'll also be sending resources, um, but you can be looking for that on Friday. If you leave this webinar series with unanswered questions, please reach out to us. We'd love to get, um, get you the answers if we can. Uh, it's our job. And so tonight, I'm gonna go ahead and introduce to the presenters. We're gonna start out, um, hearing from Dr. Greg Rinfro from the University of Kentucky, um, and he is the Meat Science Specialist in the College of Agriculture, Food, and Environment. Uh, next, we're going to hear from John Edwards, one of the owners of Trackside Butcher Shop, and then we're going to close out the evening with hearing from Brent Lackey, our colleague and Senior Business Development Specialist with Cape Card, and he's going to talk about um, developing your business and marketing plan. So the last thing before we get into Dr. Renfro's presentation is um, just who the audience is tonight. About 50% of you have been raising cattle for more than 10 years, and 20% of you have been raising cattle for five to 10 years. So we've got a lot of experienced cattle farmers on the call tonight, or we should. Um, and only 39% of you currently process and sell finished beef. Um, what that tells us is that there's there's interest among experienced cattle farmers in um, selling finished beef or you wouldn't be on the webinar tonight. Um, so with that, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and I'm gonna allow 
um, Dr. Renfro to come host and share his screen. All right. I guess it's my turn then. Yes, it's all, all right. yours. It's all me. Well, it's good to be here this evening. Um, this is, I guess uh, they say this is the new normal doing these webinars like this. And it is is kind of fun to do these. It's good practice for us as we start to get into the uh, uh, starting the semester uh, this, I guess, another month, you know, and it's, it looks like the semester for teaching college students is going to be half uh, in person and half uh, uh, webinars like this through, through Zoom. Uh, definitely COVID-19 has changed things. It's kind of created what I guess the, 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 the phrase, the new lexicon is, is uh, uh, the new normal, so to speak. And let's see, how come we're not going down here? I swear I've got, there we go. Um, technology can be a little bit of a challenge sometimes. Uh, here's the, the stage that we have set for us in front of, in front of us, and, and Olivia did a really good job of talking about how some of you were already direct marketing cattle or beef off of your farm to consumers, and then the COVID-19 pandemic hit and it became a little bit more of something you feel like you, you should do or there's an opportunity to do that kind of stuff. Uh, we as a country where we are a meat eating country uh, ever since we've tr started tracking red meat consumption in the early 1900s that line has continued to go up uh, and it, it dips in in valleys you know we had a big valley in, in the, during the great depression and during world war ii and then we had another valley in, in the energy crisis in the 70s and we kind of seen it go down again uh, during the Great Recession, but since the Great Recession, we've seen that go up. And it, it, oddly enough, as you can probably see the uh, the uh, trend there is is if the economy is doing good, people eat more meat. Uh, we are projected in the next couple of years as a per capita consumption of folks eating over 220 pounds of meat. Uh, of that total, we eat about 65 pounds of it is beef. Um, we uh, have, of that, and then you break it down even further, about 55% of that is ground beef. Uh, and so we, we do eat a lot of meat in this country. Uh, uh, and here we are in a situation where meat consumption was going up. And, and even during the pandemic, ever since we've been in this lockdown, and I've really watched this closely since the beginning of March, volume wise we continue to consume and purchase a lot of meat now part of that i think was uh early on what we were seeing was the the whole concept of stockpiling or panic buying uh kind of like we did with toilet paper i've never really understood that uh panic buy there um but even though we were trying to convince people that the food supply chain was intact especially the meat supply chain being intact there were still a lot of folks out there panic buying and then all of a sudden COVID hit the meat packing industry. Our big processors were having uh, their workers test positive and they would have to temporarily close and do deep cleaning. And then all of a sudden we started to see some shortages, a small little kind of hiccup for a few weeks where we were seeing shortages in the grocery store. And, and what I've been hearing is it seemed to be a little bit more of a challenge in the uh, rural areas versus in the uh, uh, in more urban areas. We saw uh, limits in grocery stores that lasted for a couple three weeks and then we kind of got back to normal we, we instituted all the the uh, the social distancing and the physical distancing and the temperature checks and all the welfare stuff that we have with our processors and they started to open back up the challenge we're, we have in front of us is are, are we starting to see the beginnings of a second spike i, I know that the, the hot topic we see a lot of times nowadays is, is the uh, folks upset that the governor uh, of the Commonwealth here wants us to wear a mask as we go out. Uh, and as, as we're starting to see our positive tests go up, we're seeing others go that, uh, go that route as well, especially we get into California and Florida and Arizona and Texas where they're seeing lots of more positive cases than they did before. So we may be at the beginning of that. What's that going to do with the, the uh, demand again, you know, as folks go through that. The one thing that some of you might have been thinking about before this or we're doing it already or then realize that there's shortages in the store, 
maybe it's time for me to kind of step up and, and utilize uh, the beef off of my farm to kind of fill in those gaps. And so that's kind of what we're here tonight is to, is to kind of talk about some things that you think about and consider when you first start thinking about and getting into this direct marketing of the own, your own beef off your farm or farmer's markets or something along those lines. Uh, so again, there's more than what can go over in a, in a uh, 30 minute time frame or so. And I'll, I'll reiterate this at the end. If you ever want us to sit down and talk about this, uh, you can always email me or call me. I'm always open for that kind of stuff. However, before we start, there is a huge elephant in the room that we've got to discuss, and that is finding a meat processor. Now, we're going to tackle that subject here in a few minutes in a, as a different way, but right now, meat processing in Kentucky is maxed out. Meat processing in all of our neighboring states are the same. I was getting phone calls from people in north of Indianapolis looking for a meat processor. I, I joke the only two states that I get didn't get phone calls from us that are border us is Illinois and Missouri. Everybody else, farmers were calling me looking for a processor. Talked with a processor a few weeks ago. He says, I'm taking bookings into October 2021. And then just this week, I talked to a farmer who was trying to find a place to take somebody, take their cattle, try to find somebody to take them to. And he says, that my process that I use, I can't get in until March of 2022. So we're talking year and a half plus out, all right? That's going to be a major issue. Now, the philosophical discussion that we could have is as we get through this pandemic, and I'm, I'm not saying that we're through it now, but I did read an article today where they're getting ready to test 37,000 people with a vaccine. I, I, I also heard on the radio that they were talking about a company that came up with a ventilation system that not only can trap the virus, but it can disable it and kill it as well. Are they, what's this whole process, or is this whole situation going to look like a year from now, a year and a half, two years from now? Are the people going to keep those bookings? I don't know. And maybe, maybe John after this can, can allude to that as well and give his thoughts because he's on the front lines of that kind of stuff. But let's just pretend that we don't have this meat processing issue. And, and for folks that are wondering, we are trying to address that at the state level as well. Let's just pretend that we don't have that issue and some things you need to think about. First and foremost, everybody wants to do things legally. At least I hope you want to do things legally. And before you can sell anything in, in the U.S. as far as, as red meat and poultry goes, it has to be inspected by the USDA first. <clears throat> this was a law that was enacted back in 1906. We still operate under that law. We've adapted it, we've changed it, we've added things to it. <clears throat> but for the most part, we still operate under that law. And it mandates that if you're going to have a piece of meat that's going to enter into interstate commerce, I believe is the verbiage that's used in the law, it has to be inspected by the government prior to sale. This is to ensure that number one, that you're, you the consumer are consuming a wholesome product. It came from an animal that was free of disease, that was healthy, all right? It was processed in a clean and sanitary environment. <clears throat> the people doing it practiced sanitary uh, uh, hygiene as well. It was handled humanely. It was stunned humanely, basically to ensure a wholesomeness, all right? This is a law. There's no exceptions to this. I hesitate to use the phrase, I've heard it all, because every time I say, well, I think I've heard about every scenario that somebody could come up with. Uh, it has to be inspected. You, you, uh, you can't go out there and say, okay, well, what if, what if I take it to trackside and they slaughter the animal for me and I bring the carcass back and cut up my kitchen? Nope, you can't do it. What was inspected? No, the cutting up has to be inspected. And then they come back and say, what if I slaughtered on the farm and take it to trackside? No, Again, everything has to be done. And, I, and reason why I bring that up is you need to make sure that all areas of the plant that you're working with are inspected. We've had a, situ a few situations in the past where the farmer did not communicate with the, the, the uh, processor and say, this is what I plan on doing, and simply ask, are you inspected? And the processor says, yes, but not everything was inspected. That means that the carcass, the slaughter portion has to be inspected, the cutting up of the carcass has to be inspected, the making ground beef and so on, all has to be inspected. You need to sit down and, and have a conversation with that processor because his inspection legend goes on there. 
Now you can see on your screen there, I've got wholesomeness and then I've got eating quality. Okay, wholesomeness, those little round stamps, those are the inspection stamps. The shields that you see that say prime, choice, select, those are for the USDA beef quality grading system. They're designed to predict palatability. How's that going to taste? Inspectors are inspectors, graders are graders. They're not interchangeable. They, in fact, it's two, actually two different branches of the USDA. You have to, by law, have your product inspected before you can sell. You do not, by law, have to have it graded. All right, so you can sell beef without having that USDA prime choice select stamp on it. Okay, so let's talk about choosing a meat processor. And I, I threw our friends at Trackside up here because John's going to talk with us afterwards. And I know, and I think everybody would agree, location is always going to be a consideration. Yes, there may be a process that, processor out there that works well for you, is, is the guy that's, he's the lock to make to fix your key type of person but it does you no good if he's three hours away. So we understand that. But when you sit down with that processor, you need to do a few things. Number one, you need to communicate with that processor what you plan on doing, because he's gonna be your ally in this whole process. He's gonna be there to work with you. And you need to ask yourself, all right, can I work with this individual? Because I can almost guarantee you, he's thinking the same thing, all right? Can I work with this individual and help them in to do it? Uh, help them with their goals that they're wanting to do. If they have a retail meat case, take a look at that meat case, all right? Is, look at the cuts in there. Is, are those cuts something you want your name on? Is it, because that's going to be an indication of what you're going to get back. And the, the good thing is, is 99% of our meat processors do a really good job. If they have a retail meat case, they do a really good job of focusing in on quality and how things look. Don't forget, we are visual people, all right? We're very visual people. Uh, when you walk into the facility, I understand meat processing facilities have a smell. I've been doing this for over 32 years ago. I lost that sense of smell for that about 30 years ago. But I understand they have a smell and that they're going to have that smell. But also ask yourself, is it a pungent smell? Is there uh, a, a rancid smell or something along those lines? Because that can be an indication of sanitation. All right, you don't want any part of that. If you do walk in there and you do smell sanitizer, you do have a hint of bleach in the air. That's not a bad thing. That means they're, 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 they're being cleaned and sanitary. The big thing is what do you do if things go wrong? And that kind of goes back up to that other bullet point of working with this individual. Nine times out of 10, there's going to be a challenge. Something's going to happen and you're not going to get what you asked for or something along those lines, all right? What ends up happening is it happens once, you let it go, it happens the second time, maybe you get a little upset, maybe say something, but don't really uh, communicate very well what's going on. And then you say, okay, this is a free market system. I'm gonna leave, I'm gonna switch meat processors, okay? Nine times out of 10, when you switch meat processors, you're starting all over again. And a lot of times when I've chatted with meat processors and I say, you know, hey, I heard so-and-so as well, oh, yeah, they quit coming here. And then, you know, we have a conversation, well, yeah, they weren't happy with it. The processors like, well, nobody ever told me, you know, so they're willing to work with you as well. The other thing they're gonna ask you is, how soon can we book animals, all right? That's gonna be a big thing because if they're gonna work with you, they want to make sure that you have animals and that you have a constant booking for them. And that if you do have reservation spaces that you always bring those in. So they're looking for that constant flow as well. And so they're gonna make sure that you're, you're, you're willing to do what you need to do as well. Um, the other thing that they're going to, we're gonna talk about is packaging. So we we've, we've understand we gotta have a USD inspector now We've picked up our picked out our meat processor that we're going to work with. Now the next thing we got to think about is the the, the animals being harvested. We're cutting the the carcass up. There's now we got to package this this uh, this carcass. These retail cuts. There's several different types of packaging technologies out there from everything from freezer paper, which I don't recommend, to PVC overwrap, and PVC stands for polyvinyl chloride. That is the the type of packaging that you see at grocery stores work works really well for a grocery store but pvc overwrap is not going to work very well for what you're wanting to do 
the option you have is vacuum packaging. And the challenge with vacuum packaging is, is it goes in there and it sucks out all the air. So there's no oxygen left in there to make that piece of beef cherry red. It's gonna be a darker red to a purple color. Again, like I said earlier, we're visual people. So this is where you as the farmer that's selling this to your customers, you're gonna to have to educate yourself and explain to them what's going on here that if they want, as soon as they open that package up, it should bloom, which is the action of the oxygen ox uh, binding with the myoglobin in the, on the muscle to make that bright cherry red color. The reason why I, 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 I tell you to do the vacuum packaging is and suggest vacuum packaging is it does two things. Number one, allows your customer to see the cut. You do freezer paper, they can't see the cut. The other thing is it prevents freezer burn. Now freezer burn, as you can see in the picture, and I think we've all seen this before, something we've forgotten in the back of the freezer. If you eat that, it's not going to hurt you, all right? It is a flavor thing. It's not a very good flavor. And as we're gonna discuss in the next slide is, is selling things. If you're doing freezer beef, that consumer expects that very last package that comes out of that freezer to taste just like the very first package that came out of the freezer. And vacuum packaging allows that because it may be several months before they get to that very last uh, package that's in the freezer. So the vacuum packaging, as long as that vacuum stays intact, is going to help you prevent freezer burn. The other thing is labels. This is where that relationship with your processor becomes extremely important because labeling is a big thing. You can have just a simple generic label that has the species, the wholesale cut, the retail name, the safe handling label that we have to have on there, especially if we're going to a farmer's market, that inspection legend, price per pound, maybe total price. It's got to have all that stuff on there. And you can be fairly generic. We call that a generic label where it's just a white label with black lettering. Some of our processors have the technology that they can add artwork to that, all right? And they can get that approved with their inspector. You have to be extremely careful when you start making claims on that label. For example, in the picture reader, we have organic. Organic is a very, very protected word. You cannot simply put organic on there because it sounds good, all right? Other things like raise, uh, I get a kick out of this. Cattle is, you know, is hormone free. No, they're really not hormone free. The, both the animals and plants have to have hormones to grow. You can say, I didn't add hormones. You can see in the label, raised without the use of hormones, same with antibiotics. So you need to be very careful when you start getting in there and making label claims because that can get you in trouble if you can't back that kind of stuff up, all right? Uh, so peddling your wares, all right? This is where the rubber meets the road. So we've got our animal processed, we've got them cut up, we've got them in packages. Um, probably for a lot of farmers, the easy thing to do is the concept of freezer beef, all right? However, with freezer beef, uh, not a lot of your consum consumer base is going to have that big deep freeze. The only freezer they probably have nine times out of 10 is what's above their refrigerator, all right? And so if you're going to sell freezer beef, chances are that person's not going to be able to buy a whole carcass. They don't have the room for 300 to 400 pounds of product going into their freezer above the, the, uh, the refrigerator. Halves are the same way if you're doing just a half of beef. Quarters may be a little bit more manageable. And this is where you may have to kind of work with folks and, and develop a group of individuals. We call that a beef share, all right? So where maybe four people go in and they purchase a whole animal off of you, the whole carcass, and they're able to divvy that out to the end of their freezer, okay? Freezer beef this, again, kind of loop back to the whole concept of the, uh, of the vacuum package. As you can see, if this is a whole beef inside this picture here, that consumer wants that very last package to taste just like it's that first one that came out of there. So you see how, uh, you know, you have to be careful when you're doing the freezer beef to make sure you got enough folks to, to help you out there. Others may want to do the whole farmer's market or roadside stands. That's where you're going to sell an individual retail cut to your consumer. Um, the challenge is, is that requires a little bit more work. Most of our farmer markets happen, farmer's markets, sorry, I got a little jumbled in my words there. Most farmer's markets are on a Saturday and not a lot of folks want to give up an entire Saturday uh, to do that kind of stuff. 
Now, the other thing that we haven't talked about is pricing, all right? Local product demands a higher price. We don't have the economies of scale to make that cheaper. And so what ends up happening is you're at a farmer's market. Folks are willing to pay that premium, that local premium for a ribeye, a strip steak, a T-bone, or a filet mignon. They may not be willing to pay that premium for a roast or ground beef. And so that's where we've had success with suggesting people do these things called bundles, all right? This is, this is kind of a light, light, light version of the freezer beef program where maybe you have a $25 bundle that has a few steaks, a few roasts and some ground beef in there and you go up to a 50, 75, however you wanna do that. The last thing you wanna have happen is you come home from the farmer's market and you sold all the good stuff, the rib pies, the strip steaks and everything else. But now you're stuck with a bunch of chuck roast and round roast and a bunch of ground beef. And it's gonna be very, very difficult to get rid of that kind of stuff. So if you do a bundle, that helps you out a lot when, you, when you, you're you not gonna get stuck with those, those uh, as we call in cuts, the roast and the ground beef that folks may not want as well. Um, here's the big thing, you know, that this is the beauty of farmers markets is you have a group of individuals that go to a farmers market for the experience. And this is where you have to have really good customer service. You've got to tell your story, regardless if you're a traditional farmer, your animals are just simply traditional animals, or you're organic, or you're grass finished, or natural natural, maybe even have heritage breeds or a big one as well. You need to tell that story, all right? People want to hear your story. In reality, they're, they're buying your story. The meat just comes with it. They want to know that it was a family farm. They want to know that you're the third, fourth, fifth generation on that farm. They really enjoy the fact that your kids are involved in 4-H and FFA. They want to know that about the cattle as well that you're selling they really want that because they're going to sit down with their friends at a dinner party with your beef and they're going to say yeah we get this off of a guy that we know a farmer that we know so tell that story when you're at that farmer's market and i'll also throw this out there as well you need to be familiar with the industry as a whole okay got to be familiar with the industry as a whole because that consumer trusts you to answer their questions there's some, there's some research out there and it's gonna be funny. I'm gonna, I'm gonna give an example of research, how it's a bad thing by using research, okay? But there's research out there that shows that when they ask consumers, who do you trust to get your information about animal agriculture? Who do you trust to get that information from? <clears throat> Farmers were third on the list. Guys like me, scientists, we were way, way, way down on the list. And it's funny, we have been told that consumers, they like hearing from scientists, but they don't like scientific information. And what I say is just exactly what I started out saying is research tells us blah, you know, consumers don't really like that kind of stuff. So they can, they, they want to hear the story. They want to ask you questions because they trust what you, the farmer are saying to them. And this is why you need to understand the industry because you're going to get these strange uh, questions. And I can tell you as an extension specialist for doing this for 14 plus years that <clears throat> I always know it's going to be an extremely fun conversation when it starts out with I was reading on the internet that or it was on Facebook or YouTube or whatnot. I always know that those are going to be interesting conversations because that's where folks get their information. Out. So it's good for you to become familiar with the industry. You can contact me, you can contact folks at the Kentucky Cattlemen's Association as well. You can even sit down and talk with your meat processor and say, hey, this is what I've been told. Is this true? And in nine times out of 10, they're gonna tell you that, that it's probably not true, you know, that we are extremely clean. We are extremely sanitary. The, it's funny because that, that, that question comes up a lot because people are still relating what happened 114 years ago with the current industry. And it doesn't hurt folks, you know, that again, that individual shopping at that farmer's market, they're wanting something special. They may be going home for a special occasion, a special dinner or a dinner party. And maybe they, they're gonna ask you for your family recipe. How do I cook this and so on and so forth. So it doesn't hurt to have some of those in your back pocket or even if you're uncomfortable doing that kind of stuff, 
uh, you know, you can contact Kentucky Cattlemen's Association. They have recipe cards that they can give you that you can hand out as well. So there's a lot more to selling this. And I wanted to leave a little bit of room at the end. I, I got this doing this effort. I don't know if anybody's aware. This is this is all-star race tonight, you know, and that's in Bristol and they got the lights under the cars like this. So I'm really looking forward to that. Um, but I wanted to uh, uh, leave a little bit of room here at the end uh, and uh, see if we got any questions for folks. So with that, I will stop sharing my screen and see if folks have any questions. And hush hey, Dr. Me. Renfro. Uh, yeah. Uh, this is Spencer. I've been kind of watching the board come in and there are yeah. a few questions for you. Sure. Um, one of the first ones, uh, and a few people have asked this, um, what is the law for farms selling animals live by the pound? If you, are you I'm going to assume you're talking about selling the animal to the individual. They own the animal and they take it to the processor. Is that what we're looking at? That's correct. Yeah, okay. they're, they're selling a live animal to, a, to one of their customers and then it's up to them to have it processed. Yeah, there you go. And, and uh, we get this a lot of times and uh, there's nothing wrong with that as long as on paper they own the live animal. And you as the may be kind enough to take that animal to the meat processor for them. Those animals can go to a what we call a custom uh, shop or a custom slaughterhouse where the, uh, the processor is performing a service for the individual. So, so the far, you, you, sell, you, the farmer, sell the animal to, uh, you know, Mr. Smith. And so you take the animal to the processor for Mr. Smith. He handles all the, maybe the processing fee and, and all that stuff. He handles that. Now, the, what's going to happen is those packages are going to get stamped not for sale. So that is intended for you and your family's consumption. So you, there is kind of a, there's a loophole in that that you can do that, but they have to own the animal as it's a live animal. Okay. Um, another question that was asked is, um, so how many meat process or how many meat inspectors are in the state of Kentucky? And the second part to that is, um, is a lack of inspectors causing the backlog at the processing plants? Uh, it's, I don't know how many inspectors there are. Um, they have to be present at all the, the slaughters and the cutting up. I, I have not heard that uh, that's what's causing the, the backlog. I think it's just being to the demand for having animals processed. Uh, the one thing I will give props to the USDA uh, for what they were doing. Um, when we were at the height of this whole COVID uh, situation, they were pulling administrators out of their offices and sending them out into the field to be inspectors because we, you know, inspectors are human beings too. And, and especially at these big plants, a lot of them got, came down with COVID and got sick as well. So, I mean, they're, they're always looking for more inspectors if somebody's looking for a job, but uh, uh, I wouldn't think that's the, the challenge for the, the process that we're having now. I think it's just the fact that we just, the demand's there now because folks are still a little, a little scared, a little punchy about the food supply. And uh, you mentioned kind of the difference between USDA inspection and uh, having them graded, but if someone wanted their, their beef graded, how would they go about requesting that to be done? The, the good thing is, is we do have two graders that are paid for by the Kentucky Department of Agriculture. Uh, you can contact, I believe they have a web page. I don't have it immediately in front of me, but you can go there and request your, your cattle to be graded. And, and it's free of charge. Okay. Um, another question that has come in, let's see, make sure I'm at the right place here. Um, so there, one, one person asked that uh, they've noticed a little bit of air in their packaging. It's a vacuum sealed package. Uh, mm -hmm. Is that normal or okay? Uh, there, it depends on what your definition of a little bit of air. There shouldn't be any air in that package, but what end, ends up happening is sometimes they get uh, shuffled around and you do get a broken vacuum seal there. Uh, but you'll also sometimes get wrinkles that look like there's air in the package. I, I'd have to see it to give you a definite that is air in the package versus it's not air in the package. 
if you do think that there's air in the package, the one quick way to, to find out is if you, when you thaw it out, chances are, you know, you'll, you'll be able to tell it then. You know, and, and when you thaw them out, you know, again, water expands. Meat is about 70, 75%. It expands inside that package. And then when you thaw it out, it'll break that vacuum seal as well. Uh, and then uh, one more question here, if we've got time. Um, sure. Would, uh, I know there's been some talk, uh, based on the question, there's been some talk of things like a Prime Act. Uh, is there any potential legislative changes that could help with the processing issue? Uh, that is uh, one, of our, one of our congressmen, uh, elected official, uh, Thomas Massey, is talking about the Prime Act. And I'm not for sure where that stands. I do know that he's, he's is proposing that as well. I have no idea where that stands. I don't even know exactly what's in that uh, proposed uh, legislation at all. Uh, I would be very curious to read it. I just haven't had the opportunity to read it. I'm not, you know, a lot of times that stuff goes through several, several changes before it goes on to the, uh, the voting floor. But I will say, throw this out there, it looks like Olivia's coming on, she's gonna give me the hook. Um, if, again, if folks need more help with this or curious about this kind of stuff, uh, I'm fairly easy to find at UK, you can email me. Even if you call me, even if I'm not in my office because of this, it sends me an email so I can usually return your phone call in a timely fashion. Thank you much. Um, we are gonna transition to John Edwards of track side and I've got a couple slides for you John if you just want to start out with those and then um, talk about whatever you want to and we'll field, field some questions okay okay so do I need to uh, advance anything you're you're good to, I'll I'll advance good. it for you yep. okay uh, so again my name is John Edwards uh, I own trackside butcher shop along with my partner Chris Wright uh, we have, will have been open for five years this coming November uh, we're located in Campbellsburg, Kentucky, and uh, we're at, that's Henry County, if you're not familiar with uh, the, the region, but uh, we're about halfway between Louisville and Cincinnati, if that, if that helps any. So uh, we're USDA inspected uh, uh, processing plant. Uh, as the slide there says, there was a feasibility study performed in 2013 uh, that, that showed that there was a great need for processing in that area. And then we, we uh, started pursuing it and opened our doors in, in late 2015. Uh, we do beef, hog, goat, and lamb there. Uh, beef is the primary species that, that we process the most of. So uh, I myself, my background is that, that I raised freezer beef uh, myself before I opened our, our processing facility. So I know the obstacles, I know the headaches, and I know the, the problems that you're up against because I come from that background and then, and then transitioned over into the processing side of it. So uh, I have the unique ability to be able to really help you on, on this end of it if, if you have never processed with us or you're interested in processing with us. So uh, we, can, you know, we can help out a lot with that as well. I guess what I'm getting at. Uh, so probably, if, if I had one piece of advice, uh, if you're new going into this, or even if you've been processing already and you're, you're looking to get new customers, uh, the biggest thing I would probably suggest is setting your customers' expectations. Uh, so I see it uh, on a very regular basis. Uh, the customer comes to pick up the beef. So you, you as the farmer have sold the beef uh, to someone whether they got a half, a quarter, or a whole. And, uh, and so they, they are coming to pick up that beef and they're checking, they're paying their invoice for the processing. And I can see it in their eyes right then. You know, they're, they're, they're looking at their invoice of what they paid me. They are thinking about how much they paid you for the, for the beef. And the next question that comes out of their mouth is, well, how much did I get? And so, uh, you know, typically they know the live weight of the animal and oftentimes they might know the hang weight. And so they just, a lot of times don't know what to expect when it comes to how much product they're actually gonna put in their freezer. 
so that's going to take some education on your part, uh, a, a lot of digging. And like us as a processor, we can help you with that. We can help you, uh, you know, figure out what realistic expectations are. Uh, so more than anything, you know, uh, bone in versus boneless affects that uh, tremendously. So if you get uh, T-bones as opposed to fillets in New York's, if you get bone-in ribeyes as opposed to boneless ribeyes, you go with chuck roasts that are bone-in instead of boneless chuck roast, uh, those all affect the, the, uh, the final yields. Uh, if you get the heart, liver, tongue, and oxtail, if you get soup bones, all those things add pounds to, to what you take home and add, add more value. But if you don't want a bone-in ribeye, then there's no point in getting it. But you have to, you have to uh, set the expectations of the customer. And so whether you fill out the cutting instructions for them or you allow them, you know, you allow us to call your customer for you and, and fill it out, you know, the more, anytime I try to help some, uh, somebody new that I can tell is, is a first time customer of getting uh, freezer beef, you know, I, I try to, I try to set that expectation then and, and, and help them out with that. Uh, but if you help them fill out the cutting instructions, you know, if they say they want boneless everything, then, then you start kind of warning them, well, your, your yields go down because of that. And so, you know, setting those expectations are, are one of the first and foremost things that, that, uh, I try to tell people. Uh, the next thing is, decide what you're going, what your product is, whether it's grass fed, whether it's grass fed grain finished, whether it's, you know, just basically full grain from the, from the time it's, it's weaned to the time that, that you take it to the slaughterhouse, whatever, whatever your product is, make it the best it can be. So uh, like I told you in the beginning, I came from a, a background of raising freezer beef and, and having them processed and, and, and selling them consumers. So I did a terrible job. I, I, I had no idea how bad of a uh, producer I was. You know, my, my beef were too small. Uh, they, they did not get, I, I, I did a grain fed uh, beef. They did not get enough grain. They, they were nowhere near finished. And, and I see that on a very regular basis at our establishment. Uh, probably, I would guess, this is not anywhere scientific, but I would guess less than 25% of the beef that we process in our, our establishment would grade choice. And so that goes back to what Dr. Ren <clears throat> Dr. Renfro had mentioned about the, uh, the USDA beef quality grading system. Uh, so, you know, that, that kind of puts perspective that, that really on a, on a large scale, uh, we're prob you know, as Kentuckians, we're probably not doing a very good job of finishing beef. Why is that important? Well, you want repeat customers, uh, whether you're going to a farmer's market or whether you're selling halves and quarters, uh, your easiest sale is that should be the second sale. You know, you, you, you made that relationship that Dr. Renfro talked about. You told your story uh, to the customer. They like you, they, they want to purchase from you, and then they take it home and they try it and they either have a good experience or they have a, a lackluster experience. And so if they have a good experience, then that second sale is an extremely easy sale because they're gonna come back and they're gonna want more. So that's why it's so important to uh, have a quality product. Uh, one of the best, I don't know, one of the pieces of advice I give people uh, that are talk, that talk to me about starting to, to do freezer beef for the first time is I'll tell them, don't get in a hurry. Uh, for the first year, decide to feed out two beef. You, you keep one for yourself and you you sell one to a critical friend, somebody that, that is going to take that product and try it and give you some good critical feedback. Uh, and, and, and then you wanna keep one for yourself so that, that if you're proud of that product, 
uh, it's going to make it easier for you to sell. You're going to, if you, if you have pride in it, you, you like the quality of it, you like the taste, the flavor, everything is good. Then when you go to sell that to the customer, uh, it's going to be a much easier sale. Uh, and, and then again, getting feedback from, from a customer that, or a, a friend that that's going to be able to tell you the truth and, and give you the, the pros and cons of what, what you've sold them. Uh, and I'll, I'll stop at any time. If, if, if you all want to interrupt me, I will gladly stop at any time with, because a lot of time I get a lot of questions. I'm happy to, to, to field questions. Uh, we are reaching close to 745. So maybe I, it's probably time to, to cut it off. Is there any questions that, that I might be able to answer? There's a few questions, uh, that came in, John. Mm -hmm. Um, the first one is, what keeps you from being able to harvest more animals and what advancements would help you? Uh, so over the past five years, we, we have expanded everything that we possibly can within the footprint of our building. Uh, we have added additional employees. We have added additional equipment and uh, our, our bottleneck now is just purely our, our facility. Uh, we are we are running at over 100% of the, the capacity of our building currently, uh, but we are looking to uh, uh, expand. Uh, we we just recently got approved for a, a, a KD, uh, Kentucky Ag Development Fund uh, expansion so that we can build on and, and have additional processing and, and, and cooler and freezer space. Great, thanks. Um, and then the second question, and then we'll probably move on to um, Brent's presentation, but to the attendees, feel free to keep shooting in questions. Um, hopefully we'll get an answer. But um, the second question is, as a processor, why are you not more selective on farmers who bring you quality product? Well, so every, nearly every beef that we process is for someone else. And so, uh, they, we are not purchasing the beef for us to resell or to sell on a wholesale level. Uh, the, the marketing is done by the farmer. And so, uh, the, the beef that, that I talk about the 75% that aren't, aren't going to, wouldn't grade choice, uh, still belong to that farmer. And so probably, uh, I would guess a lot of it is just, uh, uh, lack of knowledge. I mean, it, not knowing that, that what they're bringing in is 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 less than choice. Uh, like Dr. Renfro mentioned, getting them graded through Kentucky Proud uh, has been a great resource for uh, many of our customers. So if you're pro if you're if you're not aware of that and your processor hadn't told you about it, uh, look into it because you can get your beef process or get your beef graded, and and the the graders will talk to you directly. They can tell you what they found. They can give you recommendations on what they would they would do differently to help you get to that next level. So they're a great tool and a great resource. So uh, I would highly recommend that. Thanks, John. Um, Thank you guys. We're gonna move next to um, Brent Lackey. And Brent, if you just wanna turn your video on and then we'll move through your slides. There we go. All right, thanks, Olivia. Um, it's, it's, it's a tough act to follow John and Dr. Renfro. Me and Greg, those guys are, are doing a great job and their presentations were very good. So I will do my best to follow up with them. I do appreciate the opportunity to be here tonight to talk about you know business plans and how we work with those at KCARD. We've worked with numerous um, people who are marketing meat in various ways of, of business planning is something we work with a lot on all our clients. Um, this is what we're going to, I'm going to try to talk about tonight, just some of the key points throughout a business plan that you need to think about in marketing meat, um, which are somewhat very generic to any business plan, but I'll try to make it specific toward meat marketing as I can. And um, I would want to mention before I forget it, you know, on our website, um, you can find a business plan development guide that kind of covers all of the key questions you need to look at when you do a business plan. And it kind of breaks that business plan down into business description, marketing plan, the management operations plan, and the financial analysis, the financial projections. Those are the key sections, you know, and like I said, that development guide on our website is, is very helpful. 
it can really help you think, start thinking about those key questions when you're thinking about a business plan. Um, the first thing that you want to do when you're, when you're looking at a business plan, no matter what, any type of planning you're doing, is you really want to think about what are your goals for the operation and what are your goals for this, for this business. And that should be the focus of your efforts as you move forward. Um, you don't want to take a shotgun approach and just and, and shoot out and, and spray out and hope you find success. The more narrow and more targeted your focus is, that will be that more likely you are to be successful. Really think about what your end in mind is, what, where you want to be, and really you know put specific goals in place that you can measure and see how well you're going toward those. Also, those goals are important to guide your decisions and what you do. Is as you're going in business, you know, different things come at you and different opportunities come. If you, if this thing isn't isn't moving you toward a goal, then you need to get it get it out. It, it's, it's it's keeping you from getting where you want to be. Or do you need to redefine your goals because of this opportunity that's come forward? But always be having those goals in mind. Be specific. See how you're doing. Measure. See how you're doing, and, and reset those. The potential goals you can have, or you know, number of beef that you want to process and sell in a given year. I want to do in year one. I want to I want to sell three beef, and by year five, three, I want to be selling 20 beef a year, or or something like that. Be thinking about those types of things. How much extra value per pound do I want to get by on my beef by doing this versus just selling it to a traditional markets. Next slide. Um, one of the key things that you want to do when you're, you know, when you're doing your business plan, when you're thinking about planning your operations, you want to do some market research and analysis. And market research sounds like a really technical term, really fancy. You know, the basic terms, the things you need to do is just understand what are some basic trends in your marketplace. You know, if you're looking at marketing meat, you know, what, what, you know a simple Google search and you can see different things, you know, what, what's going on now with the with COVID-19, what are people, how are people, how is that changing consumers preferences? How are they shopping differently? Are they willing to spend more now on meat, less and stuff like that. Also really, you know, and then you can also do some really simple market research by just engaging yourself in the marketplace, going to the, re, you know, a Kroger or a Walmart and walking through uh, the store and seeing what products are out there going to different markets like a Whole Foods or something and seeing, and you know, I mean, lots of times I, I suggest, you know, I play this role when I do market research and it's really easy for me to do, but I recommend you do as well if you can pull it off. It's just to play dumb shopper in the store. Like I said, it's not, it's pretty easy for me to do, but I know one time we were working with somebody who was marketing, looking in the market goat cheese and I just stood by the goat cheese section at Good Foods Co-op and as people came through, I would kind of circle back and I'd say, why are you buying this product? And they would give me, ideas and why they like it and why they want it. And one of the things that we, I learned through that process is that people really do buy into the farm. As Dr. Renfro mentioned earlier, really, you really, you know, you're not only selling your meat, you're also selling your farm when you're selling your meat products. So you want to make sure you're, you're telling your story very well and so people can understand that. You know, understand your market, understand who your key competitors are, but some basic market research is very important for any operation. Um, next, target customers. Who are your customers? Who are they most likely to be? You know, you need to know who that is to make sure that they have the ability to purchase your product, that you're marketing to the right person. What, what's important to them? Um, how do they, you know, how, what do they value? How do they make decisions? If one of your target customers is you're looking at targeting people, you know, families from that, you know, family, households with, with kids that are under that are living at home and you know that one of the things that people value in that target range is, is convenience because they, you know, they're, they're really, the time is important to them. They're trying to keep their kids there, but you know, nutrition is probably also important to them. Um, if there's, if there's people on a, on a smaller income scale, you know, price is possibly really important, but you have to understand what, what is their value? What's driving their decision? And where are they? And also where are they, where are they shopping for the product? You know, what marketing channels are you going to use to, to reach that target customer? Is it going to be on, through online sales? Is it going to be through a, a farmer's market? Is it going to be through a CSA? Is it going to be you need to sell through various chain stores or various, you know, independent own retail stores, whether it be a chain or an independent or through a restaurant to reach that target customer? But you really have to understand that group and how they make decisions. If you're going to look at restaurants, you really want to think about, 
how you talk to that chef and how you talk to that buyer and how you make decisions and when's the best time of day to call them. Don't call a restaurant, uh, you know, owner or chef between during the time of 11 to 1 o'clock during the day or from 5 to 7 at night. They're not going to have time to talk to you. So, you know, if you call them around 2.30 in the afternoon, they, they'll probably have time to talk and get, and get some ideas. Next slide. Um, also, understand your product and service. You know, you know, with meat marketing, are you looking to just sell freezer beef in quarters and halves and holes? Are you looking to do retail cuts? Are you looking to, are you, are you going to feature fresh? Or are you going to have any other features? Are you going to be grass fed? Is, are you going to have organic? Or are you going to be um, no added hormones as, as, we, as we discussed earlier? And how does that benefit your customer? Does your target customer really value that product service? If not, then maybe you need for you to find that product. And then think about how your product benefits your customer. What is, how is your product good for your customer? Understanding that helps you figure out how to market the product most effectively. Uh, next, we'll look at pricing. Pricing is, a, is not something that's easy for anybody to do. It can be especially hard for farmers or people from rural communities because we, we, we're sometimes more price sensitive than somebody and we really don't want to um, hurt somebody's feelings by pricing something too high. Um, Mark pricing can be, you know, part of marketing. It's kind of an art. And it's also a science to it. Well, one thing that you, one thing you, with pricing is you really need to understand your customers. As we mentioned earlier, what is their willingness to pay? How much can they afford to pay? Where are they located? You know, people, you know, consumers in a rural market probably will, can pay less than consumers in probably a more metropolitan market like Louisville or Lexington. And you have to understand what those different pricings are to really effectively market something. But you know, you want to also make sure your pricing with a consistent, is consistent with your marketing. If you're marketing something that you say is a premium product, my product is better and it's, and it's, and it's worth spending on, don't price it ch cheaper than what they can buy meat at Walmart for because that's an inconsistent message to somebody. You know, that pricing does send a message to somebody. Um, you know, also, when you're, when you're pricing meat, you want to think about, next slide, Olivia, is think about ways to calculate understanding that cost that you've got in that animal. You know, you've got two, you know, you know, figure out what your break even is. Um, one way to do it is to calculate your actual cost of production and that cost to finish and then the processing. Um, probably the, what I would say the best part more of it is, you know, use that, back, if you if start with how much could I sell that, 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 that animal for at the market stockyards that if you're, if you're finishing them at 1200 pounds, if I took that 1200 animal, what would I, if I took it to the stockyards, what would I sell it for? That's your cost of the animal because that's what you could sell it for otherwise. And then add on the processing cost and then your time to get it processed to and from the processor. That gives you an idea of what your cost, your total cost is and divide that out by the live weight of the animal gives you an idea of what your, you know, that gives you an idea of how you need to price your animal. If, and then that gives you an idea, okay, if I'm getting, if I'm getting 300, you know, if I'm getting 400 pounds of meat out of this animal and my cost is, you know, $1,500 and I need to divide $1,500 by $4, and that's my break even cost. And I'm just making up numbers here. I don't know what the numbers are, but you really need to know what that break even cost is before you start doing it. And then also be thinking about what your goal per pound is that you want to have and figure out as, you know, for this whole animal, I want to average X dollars a pound, either live weight or finished weight. And then you start figuring out, okay, then you start looking, if you're doing by retail cut, and if you're doing freezer beef, it's easier to go, okay, I want to get X dollars a pound per animal out of this, then I'm going to price freezer beef at this, it's easy. If you're doing retail cuts, then you need to think about, okay, if I price hamburger at this, steaks at this and this, what, you know, I've got X number of pounds, do I get, do I reach my goal? And then when you're looking at pricing, you also want to look at what other people are doing. You want to know what the retail stores are selling those retail cuts for. You want to know what other farmers who at farmers markets are selling at that price. Also look at what other online, you know, vendors are selling for, you know, Google is a great way to figure out what different people are pricing stuff for in Kentucky and around the country, get an idea of what you should be looking at. 
um, different sales and promotion strategies that you need to be thinking about. And, and like I said, those need to be designed based on who your customer is and what your product is. Um, and you know, you, you know, various tactics that you can use are radio, website, meet social media, radio or print, signs, going to events, printing materials. Um, Social media is becoming a much, much bigger part of marketing these days, and it's a great way to, for you to market directly to that consumer. And it allows you to figure that you can really target your consumer that way. Uh, Facebook, you know, is, is one of the most more common social media things. The next slide, will you? you know, Facebook's got a very broad audience. You know, it, it's a social platform. You, you can, it allows you to tell your story. As you, you know, you utilize pictures, there's various tricks that you can, you know, schedule posts so that you, you know, that allows you to make sure you're posting regularly during the this, you, you, know, you going live occasionally, feature parts of your farm, talk about your meats or let you know where you're selling stuff is a great way to, to interact or get your message out to the consumer. You can boost your posts for small, for, for you really target those boosts advertising through Facebook for a small amount. Um, another social media, you know, is Instagram. You know, and then there's some tips on here. Post with a location, get 79% more engagement. Um, Tuesdays and Thursdays showing the most engagement. You know, these are these are tips that Katie Bowman in our office has put together. She's our marketing communication specialist. Um, she kind of put these slides together for me. I know the basics of social media. If you have any really in-depth questions, I recommend that you reach out. To, I've got her contact information in this presentation to contact her about putting that social media plan to get together. Also, email marketing is a great way to really stay in contact with your clients. There's research that show that, that people who purchase the email spend 138% more, which is really surprising. Um, it's, a, it's a great way to keep your message in front of people. You do want to be conscious of them, that not over-spam them to oversend to my emails, but it is a great way of reminding people, hey, you know, this is what we got coming on. It's a great way to keep your message in front of people. Next slide. Um, you know, another key, a key point to me, and it's something that we, you know, we think is very important at KCARD is when we're doing a business plan is to think about the financial part of it. You know, what's your startup cost for, for doing this? Uh, you know, it's one thing to consider you know, as part of this. Also looking at especially a cash flow projection to figure out what is, you know, how much cash am I going to expend over the year to, to my expenses to, to be able to market my meat and how much cash can I expect back as a result? And is, does this cash flow, is it worth my time? Am I getting the net, the net cash I want? It also, that cash flow projection, doing that cash projection also allows you to measure yourself to figure out, hey, we knew we, were, we knew this year was going to be tight, but next year, if we hit our, our targets, this is where we're going to be. It allows you to identify what your targets need to be. Um, next slide. Um, and then finally, like I want would like to focus on is make sure you create some type of methods to evaluate your efforts in this. If you don't evaluate yourself, you're not giving yourself the opportunity to grow and get better at your business. You're not getting, and it's. You know, also it really allows you to improve, you know, improve your business and make sure you're on track to meet your goals. You know, have some performance measures such as number of customers, um, sales, um, number of transactions, sales per transactions. Um, those are just some some tips, some possible ones. You also want to include your cost measures and stuff like that. that. Have a sales forecast. Break it down by products. You know, and, and see how you're going. Monitoring your inventory level. Make, have something to monitor your performance and to see on a week, on a, on, a, on a regular basis. It could be weekly, it could be monthly, it could be quarterly, it could be yearly. But have those measures where you're really looking at those. They really, a, a, they, they, they challenge you to grow as a business. They challenge you to grow as a manager of your business. Have those measures put in place early. I can tell the story that when I, at one time I was a, a manager of a, a co-op vegetable marketing cooperative. Um, first year we, we, we thought that I was there, we sold more cabbage than we ever had before. I didn't do a good job managing it. As a result, the co-op didn't make much money. Next year was a much harder year of cabbage. 
but I put together a little um, dashboard of, of, of metrics I followed every day. And as a result, even though we marketed about 65% of the amount of cabbage we did the previous year, we actually made significantly amount more money for the co-op as a result of for, for the operation. So having these measures in place can improve your management of your operation. Um, we're here to help. We want to help you. We want to help you with your business plans. If it's a full business plan or if it's just talking about the marketing part of it, or if it's talking about helping with the financials, there's numbers of, of available to help. Again, my name is Brent Lackey. I've got my contact information. If you're really interested in really improving your, your marketing campaign or your social media presence, Katie Bowman is a great resource. I'll, you know, I learned something. Every time I talk to her about social media and marketing, I learn something. So I highly recommend you reaching out to her. Are there any questions, Olivia? Thank you, Brent. Yeah, we're going to move into some question time. I think Spencer's going to um, moderate that. Yeah, Brent, uh, one question I think specifically for you would be, uh, how do you get involved with the CSA for beef or, or other animals, livestock? Um, well, are you, is this, well, I guess you could, A, start your own CSA where you could just, I would research what other CSAs are out there and see, figure out baskets that are out there or see if there's other CSAs in your community or in your region who are looking to add products to their box. You know, Spencer, I think you might be able to answer that question better than me, perfectly honest, so. Yeah, and I, I think that's, that's, a, that's a solid answer on that one because uh, um, seeing who else is doing it uh, that might have products that you could add is, is a really great way to do it. Um, taking a multi-farmer approach if that's available to you. Um, another question, this, this may be for if uh, Dr. Renfro is, is still on um, or John, uh, these two may be uh, for anybody here, but uh, can you get your meat inspected if you are cutting it custom for yourself? Uh, not unless you are a USDA facility yourself. And it's not as simple as telling the USDA what you want to do and having them stop by. You have to have, uh, and John will probably back me up on this as well. There's a lot of food safety plans you have to have in place to be inspected, which includes HACCP plans, GMPs, SSOPs, and so on and so forth. Just want to make sure that, um, I don't know if this is what the person meant, but can you get your meat graded if you are having it custom processed? I, yeah, I imagine so. It was just a matter of just calling up the, uh, the two graders that we have. And, you know, cause sometimes, you know, farmers just, they're, they're doing it custom, but they just want to know, you know, feedback on what their animals are doing, you know? So that is, you, you still can do that as well. Thanks, Dr. Enfro. Um, one last question here that's come in. Um, as a producer, uh, do I, how do I ensure that uh, your beef or my beef is being graded at the highest level? Are you referring to the grader? I would assume if that's the case, then, you know, that's, those are, those are trained individuals with the USDA. Um, I can grade cattle. I could tell you if it's choice or prime or select or whatnot, but I physically cannot you know, put a stamp on there like they do. Those, those individuals are trained. It's a, you know, it's not a, it's not as simple as they just give them a set of cards and a stamp that they're, they're highly trained. Or is that a question about how can you improve the grade on your animal? I right. well, improving grade? Yeah. That is, uh, I guess that might have been a question for Jeff uh, Lim Cooler last night, but you, you got to feed them. You, know, you got to feed to your frame score. You know, uh, you know John kind of mentioned this earlier, you know, that when you put them on grain, just because you put them on grain doesn't necessarily mean, you know, they're going to get up to choice. There's a genetic factor to it. There's a grading factor, or there's a uh, feeding factor to it as well, nutritional value. Um, if you're having issues with that, I would encourage you to reach out to Dr. Lim Cooler. He's our beef cattle specialist. He can help you with rations uh, that you can feed them, length of time as well. You know, most of those cattle that go out west and go at, at is on feed then they go out west and they go on feed they're out there for a hundred plus days eating that high concentrate ration 
And, and one thing that I would add, if, if we've missed what the target of that question was, um, to Dr. Renfro's point, last night, Dr. Lim Cooler was on uh, as a panelist on our, our session of part one, and we'll have those available. Uh, we'll send everyone that's attending a link to that so that they can review that as a recorded uh, webinar at the end, by the end of this week. So uh, there was lots of good information on feeding animals there. Uh, well, all right, well, that's, that's all the questions that I see. Um, so I uh, just wanna say thanks to all the presenters tonight for spending their evening with us. Uh, appreciate your all's time this evening. Uh, this last slide that just popped up is going to be a, a slide that shows our general K card uh, phone number and email. And then there's also contact information on there for Olivia and myself. Um, so feel free to reach out to us. Like Brent said, uh, we're happy to help with your business. Um, so if you want to discuss anything with your farm or plans or what you're currently doing, we're happy to help. That's what we're here for. Uh, so in case you weren't tuned in last night, uh, just a few things before we close out for the evening. Uh, by the end of the week, recordings of tonight's webinar and from last night and tomorrow night, the one that's already happened and the one that will happen, though all three webinar sessions will be available on the KCARD YouTube channel. Uh, an email will be sent out to all attendees and this will contain a link to those recorded webinars. It'll also have some resources discussing topics that were addressed by the presenters. And the final thing it'll have will be a survey. Now that survey will ask you for input for the webinar itself. And if you're interested in follow up by KCARD or Kentucky Beef Council staff members. And if you are a member from one of those two organizations, whichever one you request, we'll be in touch with you soon. So with that, I just want to say thanks again to our presenters for tonight. And thanks to all the attendees who joined in to watch with us. Uh, join us tomorrow again at 7 p.m. for part three of our webinar series, and the title of that will be Selling Local Beef. With that, good night, everyone. Take care. <laughs>